Good morning or good afternoon. Thank you very much for your participation in this two-part training. Introduction to population grids and their integration with remote sensing data for sustainable development and disaster management. My name is Brock Blevins, RSET training coordinator, and I'll be your host for the series. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with our RSET program, we are part of NASA's capacity building program under Applied Sciences. And we are designed to empower the global community through remote sensing training. We have a variety of training types within these four application areas of air quality, water resources, disasters, and eco forecasting. Our training levels are on the spectrum from introductory all the way to advanced. And this series is on the introductory level. This two part training developed and presented by members of the Pop Grid Data Collaborative, will focus on the different population grids and their application to a range of topics related to development planning, monitoring of the SDGs, and disaster management. Briefly, the course structure and materials. This training will consist of two two-hour parts, today on March 30th and next week on April 6th. The same content will be presented at two different times each day in order to reach more time zones around the globe. Note, you only need to attend one session per day. Webinar recordings, the presentations, and the homework assignment can be found on the training webpage URL, as you see here. There'll be a question and answer session following each lecture. Please feel free to type your questions for the trainers into the Q&A section. All the questions being asked will be moved to a Q&A document. Uh, you will be able to view all the questions and answers at the end of the presentation in a document and then answered audibly. We will then provide that as a PDF on our training webpage, generally within a week for you to download to use as a resource. You can also send your questions by email to myself at the email listed here or to the RSET General Gmail account. There will be one homework assignment for this training, and they'll be given at the end of part two next week. These answers are submitted via a Google form. The deadline will be April 27th, and in order to receive a certificate of completion for this training, you have to attend both live webinars, so on March 30th and April 6th, and then complete the homework by April 27th you will receive a certificate of approximately three months after the completion of the course from Marinus Martins. So here's the training outline. Today, in part one, there will be an introduction to the Pop Grid Data Collaborative. There'll be background on the origins of gridding and its evolution from the earth sciences to present day application areas in health, humanitarianism, development, and disaster risk reduction. Approaches to gridding, global to near global products and their strengths and limitations, as well as a tour of the online platform Pop Grid Viewer will be covered. Next week for part two on April 6th, there'll be presentations of common research areas and use of population grids. Topics will include sustainable development, in particular SDG 9, as well as how population data sets are used in disaster risk reduction efforts. We are very pleased to have our two trainers here today, Stefan Leik and Greg Yetman. Stefan Leik is a professor of geography from the University of Colorado Boulder. And Greg Yetman is associate director for geospatial applications for CSUN, the Center for International Earth Science Information Network at Columbia University. So I'll send this off to you, Stefan. Thank you. Thank you very much for this short introduction, Brooke. And welcome everyone to this session one of our training, an introduction to population grids and their uses. My name is Stefan Leik, and together with my colleague, Greg Yetman, we will cover this first session and give you an intro on existing population grids and the pop grid data collaborative. We will cover 
different aspects of PopGrid. The PopGrid data collaborative itself explain a few facts what this collaborative is doing. We will give you some motivation or explain some motivation for gridding population data. Talk a little bit about methodological frameworks for population allocation and the creation of final data products. We will give you an overview of global existing global gridded population layers that are open to the user community. We will talk a little bit about PopGrid's goals moving forward and give you a short tour of PopGrid's website and the PopGrid data viewer that can be used by the user community for quick data exploration. Finally, we will provide just a short insight on some application areas where population grids are useful and conclude with some final comments on data uncertainty and fitness for use concepts that are important to, um, to be concerned about for the user community and for the informed user on target applications. The mission of the PopGrid Data Collaborative can be summarized as being concerned about data for everyone. PopGrid brings together and expands the international community of data providers, users, and sponsors that are concerned with georeferenced data on population, human settlements, and infrastructure. They do this to improve data access for the user community, data timeliness, and data consistency, as well as utility. They support data use and interpretation. They support helping the user community to identify and address pressing user needs to fully understand what are the requirements, what are the user needs out there. And finally, to encourage innovation and cross-disciplinary use. The main objective for PopGrid is technical and data advancement. PopGrid is trying this to, um, through new cooperation. They do this by channeling expertise from natural, social, health, and engineering sciences from government, academia, and private industry, as well as NGOs. This unique cooperation promotes um, producing and harmonizing high-quality data services, as well as services that can be used by the user community. The PopGrid Secretariat is a collaboration of season the Center for International Earth Science Information Network, Trends, the Thematic Research Network on Data and Statistics, as well as GPSDD, um, which is the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data. In more detail, PopGrid is trying to improve accessibility, documentation of data sets and services, to compare and contrast methods, as well as implications of different data sources to fully informed data users, what are the implications of using these different data products? To do so, they convene experts from the spatial or geospatial and demographic communities to have this expert knowledge involved to understand how it's useful, for whom it's useful, and have a scientific basis. Finally, part of, this, of these goals are to provide online tools as well as services to facilitate visualization and intercomparison, and thus, analysis for target applications. Here's a list of the data providers that are active in the PopGrid Data Collaborative. Again, you can see CSEN, the Center for International Earth Science Information Network, the CUNY Institute for Demographic Research, the Connectivity Lab at Facebook, ASRI, the German Aerospace Center, the Joint Research Center of the European Commission, ImageCat, Oak Ridge National Laboratory, the U.S. Census Bureau, as well as the World POP Program. It's a diverse group of members of this PopGrid Data Collaborative, which makes up and guarantees this new way of cooperating. There's a very interesting uh, publication that came out in 2020 that we can recommend for users who are interested in using population grids. This has been published by Mariam Rabier and Hayden Dam of the Thematic Research Network on Data and Statistics, as you can see it in this slide. And we recommend this for a quick information source, leaving no one off the map, a guide for gridded population data for sustainable development. It describes 
the most important or the central data products that we are talking about today, as well as some methodological basics, how these data are created and what the typical target applications could be and would be and have been. A few comments on the basic motivation before we go into methodological frameworks. The idea of rasterizing population has the goal to reallocate or partition census data that have been collected or that have been used for a long time. For example, a block group, um, an analytical unit, as you can see it here on the left. The goal is to reallocate population counts to, for example, grid cells and thus final resolution data where every cell holds a cell value that represents the population count at very fine scale or very fine resolution. So the idea of creating grids is to break down traditional census data to something like spatial distributions of population that hopefully can be used at finer resolution and allow us to use these data sources for fine scale analysis, target applications. Leaving no one off the map, to come back to this title, many applications in environmental sciences, sustainability, development, are related to population. They are related to population at various scales. The big obstacle are census data themselves for such applications. Census data can be infrequent. The data might miss people. And this could be due to inaccessibility because of vegetation, land use, as well as topographic conditions, where there is no access for um, field workers, for example, as well as social constraints and language. Finally, census data are summarized very often for very large areas that can even change over time. See an example here in this white oval. This is a census unit for which we have to assume that the density, the population density, is equal everywhere because we only have one population count for this large area. What we really would be interested for many applications where the operational scale is much finer is a more nuanced population distribution as here on the example of World Pop 2014 in comparison. The big question is how we can get there. How can we rasterize or grid traditional census data into these kinds of gridded ways or gridded forms of population surfaces. Nowadays, we're using advanced geographical information science and remote sensing technology as well as data, and thus make use of the ongoing geospatial data revolution. These population gridded layers or population grids are not supposed to replace census data, but they are seen as complements, complementary information that can fill in gaps in time as well as in space where traditional census data are very few in time for a certain time period or have gaps for the data themselves in, in different regions. More importantly, the estimates that we can derive from these population grids could be estimates for non-administrative units that could then be temporally consistent geographies at fine scale. One example is, for example, you might be interested in understanding how many people are living in close proximity to a stream, to a road, to a different water body, to a hazard zone. By doing this with census data, very often you have an effect as you can see it here in this left side picture. The census unit itself does not allow you to break down how many people of these 241 are living close to a stream. Should we be successful in gridding population into these cell level or grid cell estimates, we are able to provide these kinds of estimates at fine resolution. If these population grids are reliable and accurate, then we can assume that these estimates are very can give us a lot of confidence how many people are living in close proximity to our target feature. To illustrate this on real data, again, here for a region in Colombia, we have our census data, we have one count estimate, and thus we have to assume that population density is equal everywhere within that unit. Obviously, that's very unrealistic in many applications. And therefore, 
these population grids are so useful. They give us an impression of the variation, the underlying variation of population counts when we break it down to fine resolution data. Quick impression of the different data products. GPW, the oldest data product, the gridded population of the world available for different points in time. Based on GHSL, the Global Human Settlement Layer, um, the Joint Research Center has published GHS POP, which is the population service derived from GHSL. The Global Urban Footprint has been used for deriving population layers. The High Resolution Settlement Layer, a collaboration of Facebook and Season to derive a very fine resolution population estimates, LandScan by the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, as well as WorldPop, produced by the University of Southampton in the UK. There's a wide range of applications that we can think of that has been, this population data has been used already, um, and others, of course. PopGrid is very interested in spurring and um, encouraging more such applications in different fields, in different areas, scientific work, but also applied science. These fields range from land use to transportation, to resource management, resource allocation, to natural hazard risk assessments, climate change, as well as public health assessments. These population grids are also increasingly used for the development of international frameworks for development and sustainability. You can see four of the goals of the Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, where population is one of the um, most critical information to actually do measurements to understand underlying information, be it for sustainable cities, for poverty measures, or for example, for the need of clean water or water access. I will speak about the methodological frameworks in the next few slides, just to provide you a very um, simple basis of what the underlying methods are, what kind of frameworks are existing. Basically, um, the creation of these different population grids are used or are produced based on data integration approaches, population allocation methods, to different forms of aerial interpolation. There are different top-down and bottom-up approaches existing in the recent literature. The aerial interpolation method is the underlying methodological framework for many of these kinds of efforts. The simplest method is aerial weighting. Desumetric modeling is a slightly more advanced error interpolation method that is often applied using ancillary data in binary fashions or as empirical inputs. Statistical models or statistical desymmetric modeling that are often slightly overlapping with the more traditional desymmetric mapping, as well as hybrid modeling, where often machine learning is combined, um, is used or ensemble prediction to produce population weights for desymmetric refinement. There's a bibliography at the end of this presentation where the interested reader can find many different sources on desymmetric modeling, on aerial interpolation, and other methods. Let us begin with aerial interpolation. It's been developed basically to address zonation incompatibility. The simplest method, aerial weighting, is probably a good starting point to understand the idea. In aerial weighting, we are trying to estimate source populations within target zones. Source zones A, B, C, and D um, are used to make an estimate of or within the target zone E here in red. This method is based on the proportion of area overlap between the target zones and source zones. It's based only on geometry. You can see in this very simple equation that for each iteration, which goes through different source zones, we are taking the source zone area, in this case for A, take the overlapping area of E and calculate the proportion of, this, of the um, target zone overlap divided by the source zone area. This will be multiplied by the population that is estimated for source zone A. Exactly the same procedure as 
carried out for each source zone to then come up with our target population um, for our, our target zone E. So again, this is based on only on geometry. And therefore, there are limitations because we assume that the population, the counts of people living in an area is directly related to the underlying area, which of course is not realistic in many cases, but it's an interesting method that has been advanced, that has been refined over the years. Quick illustration of how this works in practice. We have one school district right here, and we know how many students are registered for this school district. We would like to estimate how many students of this school district are living in different census tracts. We have two census tracts, one and two. We know the areas of these two census tracts as well. The idea now of error weighting is to calculate the proportion between the area of census tract one divided by the area of the whole study area to come up with a proportion, as you can see here, of 0 0.709. This proportion is then applied by multiplying it with the number of students in this whole school district to have an estimate of students within census tract number one. We do the same for sector two to come up with a second estimate, in this case, for census tract number two. Again, you can see that this estimate is made based on the assumption that there is the same density of students living in each part or in each section of this um, school district. Again, might be very unrealistic because there are different population groups living in different parts of such a study area. This method is volume preserving. As you can see, the target population estimates are adding up to the ingoing, to the initial set, the initial count of students. Um, this is called a pycnophylactic property, volume preserving. Based on these simple methods, desymmetric mapping has been studied for quite some time. It's another type of error interpolation to address zone incompatibility and aggregation. That's typical, typically the case in choropleth maps. We're trying to reallocate population to mapping zones that hopefully reflect population distributions in more objective ways. We do so, that's the big difference, using so-called ancillary variables. They are limiting and related ancillary variables to make estimates that also are volume preserving. As I mentioned before, they are supposed to maintain the population counts in our source area. If successful, we might be able to calculate population estimates at fine resolution that show a more representative population distribution if the ancillary variables are meaningful and show us some strong relationships between these ancillary variables and population. Limiting ancillary variables are simple to use. They restrict the possible occurrences within the original unit where population might be living or not. Developed land or inhabited land might be just one example. Related variables or related ancillary variables are assumed to be associated with a variable of interest, population in this case. This association might be defined based on a set of rules, how the variable will influence our variable, or statistical relationships. And this could be econ economic variables, terrain-related information, road density, or other kind of variables that can be used in such models and are assumed to have a relationship to population. To illustrate the same case of a school district, this time with a limiting ancillary variable, here we have developed land. We assume in this simplified example, students can only live where we have developed land. The effect is a very obvious one because we can now adjust area to a different value. It's just the area of developed land within that school district. We can also adjust the area in each of the census tracts because we can refine it using the developed land. Everything else is exactly the same. We are calculating the proportion. This time, the proportion is slightly different as in the first case because we are just using the area of the developed land and come up with a student estimate for census tract one that's slightly below the initial value that we had with aerial weighting. 
For sector two, we do the same thing, come up with a value that's slightly higher than in the case before. So this makes it very obvious what the effects of spatial refinement can be in the simplest case of desymmetric modeling, just using a limiting variable. To summarize, error weighting has the problem or has the limitation that every grid cell in this case would have the same value within one source unit. We assume equal population density, which is very unrealistic in many real scenarios. Desymmetric mapping allows us to use ancillary variables, for example, to assume or to derive binary weights. We only allocate people where we assume people can live. Such a distribution would have a very different value for the different grid cells. Using more refined or empirically derived weights would allow us to create a more nuanced spatial distribution of the population, as you can see in this example. This might be, for example, different land use classes for which we derive different rules, how many people might be living in a certain land use class. Or we can use statistically derived weights, very often in regression form or machine learning form, where we are able to use several and three variables within the same model. It's one advantage. Second advantage is we can work with statistical inference in these models and hopefully create an even more nuanced uh, spatial distribution of population counts at the grid cell level that, if the model is strong and robust, has um, very reliable estimates and provides very accurate estimates at fine resolution. In other words, desymmetric frameworks are very dependent on ancillary variables. It's very important to identify whether or not there's a relationship between these ancillary variables and population. The user has to be aware that there might be temporal mismatches between ancillary variables as well as the population and how to address that. There might be even temporal mismatches between different kinds of ancillary variables. Furthermore, it's really important to understand the quality of these ancillary variables. What is the spatial granularity, for example, of elevation if we use it, or protected areas? What is the underlying mapping scale of road networks that are used to derive, for example, road density or the distance to roads? These are all possible data or ancillary variables that have been used in the literature for a long time and have been proven to be effective in regions where we might not have fine resolution enough data. This table provides an interesting overview on how many ancillary data or ancillary variables are used to create the different population grids. You can see the population grids that I mentioned before, and it's interesting to see how they differ in terms of what kind of ancillary variables are flowing in to the creation of these different population grids. This is directly connected to the methodological framework used for each of these population grids to be produced. Greg Yetman will now take over and talk more about the global gridded population grids that are available to the user community. Greg, please. Thanks very much, Stefan. Um, glad to be here today. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the list of global grids you see on the screen here, and we're actually going to dive a little deeper for each of them and look at the, uh, the data in in a little bit as well. So um, just to step back and introduce myself, my name's Greg Yetman. I'm a geographer at Season, and uh, I've been working with gridded population data um, since since the early 2000s, so quite a while. Um, so here on the screen, we've got a, a table showing uh, the different global data sets. Um, and when this is posted, the, the name hyperlinks to each of the data sets uh, on the organization's website. And one of the questions we get most often is, how do I choose which data set um, to use for my analysis? And I'm going to quickly go through some of the high, um, the, the high level considerations for choosing your data sets. So when you look at resolution, you may think, oh, well, I just want to pick the highest spatial resolution to get the most detail. Um, and that may be the case for some applications where you're working very locally. 
Um, but there, there's an important point to that, which is, you know, if you're doing a global analysis, for instance, working with um, 30 meter or 90 or 100 meter data can be taxing uh, to do on even a modern desktop or, or laptop. And if you need a time series, some of the highest resolution data sets don't actually have a time series. Um, they're just a current year. So for instance, if we go down the list and look at the resolutions, they vary everywhere from 30 arc seconds or roughly one kilometer for land scan and greater population of the world or GBW um, to a moderate 250 meter resolution, 150 meter resolution for uh, GHS POP from JRC and the world population estimate from ESRI respectively. And then the more detailed data sets you get are uh, world POP, which is about uh, 90 or 100 meters, three arc seconds globally. Uh, and the high resolution uh, population density maps, also known as HRSL, which is down to one arc seconds or anomaly 30 meters. Um, now the HRSL isn't truly global. It covers about 160 uh, countries and territories in the world. So a lot of the world. Um, and there is a, a release due out this year that'll cover more, even more countries. The rest of the data sets here are, are global um, insofar as they cover the inhabited earth most exclude Antarctica, uh, which I think is fine for most applications. The other thing to consider is what time periods you need and whether you need to look at change. So the GHS POP and World POP, um, which have epochs from 74, 90, 2000, 2015 for GH POP, and annualized 2000 to 2020 estimates for World POP are your best options for actually looking at population change. GPW has a series of, of estimates, um, but it's not a true population time series because it's it's based simply on proportional allocation. So the, the time series change is, is a growth rate between two points in time that's interpolated or extrapolated. So it's not ideal for a time series uh, or change, change in population over time. It's more about picking the year that's closest to your other data sets that you want to use it with. And then finally, the most complicated part is to look at the model. So the simplest model is greater population world, which is just pro proportional allocation or aerial, aerial weighting, um, where the population is distributed equally across the admin units that are in the GPW data collection. And one of the reasons we, we produce the data set this way is that it is the simplest possible model um, and independent from any other by physical or remote sensing derived variables. That is, it doesn't use something like distance to coast in the model to allocate population. So if you're interested in assessing coastal populations, you don't have to worry about a Dungeon 80. You don't have to worry about the model being biased towards population near the coast. Um, th the same is true for other variables like elevation. Uh, while the more heavily modeled surfaces um, like the land scan, world pop, world population estimate, um, really do a lot of moving population around within administrative units based on the other variables. So they are likely a more realistic uh, distribution of population, um, but they uh, use a lot of different variables for that. So you have to worry about endogeneity if you're trying to study a particular phenomenon. But if you're just interested in, for instance, a hazards assessment, those more modeled surfaces are probably more useful. Uh, and the, the GHS POP is, is machine learning to detect settlement extents and then weighted allocation or a, a binary daisometric approach to allocate population to the um, settlement extents from Landsat data uh, and more recently um, uh, higher resolution 10 meter um, Sentinel data. And the high resolution uh, population density maps, the HRSL from Facebook, actually use the most uh, the, sorry, the highest resolution input data uses 50 centimeter to two meter optical data from uh, Digital Globe, now now known as Maxar, to find settlement extents. Uh, and then a similar approach of weighted allocation or dies binary diesometric allocation to assign census data to the settlement extent. And because it's got such detailed optical input data, it is the best data set to look at rural population distributions because it finds many small settlements that it can't be found in lower resolution uh, inputs like 10 meter or 30 meter um, Sentinel and Landsat data. 
So next, I wanted to quickly uh, look at PopGrid's goals moving forward. So listed here are directly from the PopGrid website, um, uh, a longer form of the goals that, that, that Stefan showed earlier. So I'm not going to go through them in detail. But the important thing is for us um, as a collaborative to provide a, a great space for people producing these data sets to collaborate and share methods and agree on standards and and users of the data set uh, or data sets or tools that, that are based on the data sets or have the data sets as inputs to understand the implications of using the different data sets and, and selecting the one that's best for their purposes. Uh, and we've we've taken on a role of support of use of greater population data for international groups from uh, the UN, uh, specifically under the SDGs and indicator measurement, uh, different aid agencies, uh, private foundations, uh, and any other communities that are using the data for development or even commercial applications. Um, the other thing that is a little outside of our focus today, because it's not related to population data set, is infrastructure and training data. So an example would be different groups that are trying to classify settlement extent by detecting buildings uh, through PopGrid have met and, and talked and shared training data sets, like the location of known buildings with the, the date the, the building was present, so that training data, which is expensive to generate, uh, can be shared in, in across groups in the collaborative to uh, make all the data products better and and save essentially resources for all the groups that are in the collaborative. A second part of it is um, infrastructure data is a, is an aim of uh, the PopGrid data collaborative, including things like building extents, uh, roads, uh, include and building characteristics such as uh, level of built up or number of stories or construction type, which is important for things like hazards modeling and lots of other reason, research. Um, here's an example of what we've been producing uh, to support end users, uh, including academic papers and, and reports. This is a preprint that was put up just last month by uh, Dana Thompson and, and a number of folks in the collaborative to assess the different gridded population data sets related to estimates of slum populations or informal settlement populations available in um, parts of Nigeria and Kenya. And what we found is that the gridded population data sets, all of them, uh, consistently underestimate the population within slums based on uh, on the ground survey data. So the amount varies in the paper details, uh, which good data sets um, are, are closer to the estimates on the ground compared to others. But it's no surprise the, the very lightly modeled data sets like GPW4 um, and, and GHS POP are sort of the, the largest underestimates of uh, distribution population totals in slums, while the higher, uh, the more highly modeled population uh, surfaces do a slightly better job of doing that. HRSL, for instance, gets about 40% of the population in the slums, while other data sets like GPW are down to 10% or 15% of the population overall in, in the slums. So uh, the, um, the populations in slums, understanding and knowing the distribution of that population is important for the SDGs and lots of other development projects. So the, the point of this paper is that these data sets as is are not the best options for looking at slum populations. Uh, and we've made suggestions in the paper about different modeling uh, approaches and, and how additional data could be used to augment the models uh, to produce a more realistic estimate of slum population using graded approaches. Um, now I wanted to do a quick tour of the website and PopGrid viewer. So if you go to the PopGrid website, I'm going to full screen this here and go home. We're going to see that um, you know there's an overview of the project, but I think most important is this Explore Data tab, and we'll start start looking at global population characteristics. So we can see similar to the table I had in PowerPoint, but with much more detail. They've got information on each of the population, good population data sets available for global data. Um, we also have continental and country gridded population data sets. These are data sets that are not necessarily global, but maybe 
of interest because they're available in the areas you're working in with the same kind of information shown for each. And then we also have um, descriptions of settlement extent, gridded settlement extent data, which doesn't necessarily have a population estimate, but a comparison of the time and the resolution and the source data for each of these settlement extent data sets. And probably most useful for getting a quick look at the population data is to go to the PopGrid viewer. Um, this is supported by CDAC, the Socioeconomic Data and Application Center with it, that um, we had seasoned operate for NASA. Um, and you can see linked maps that show you um, five of the different data sets, four by default, and you could switch up uh, which is shown. So all of these data sets uh, are available. It's more than five, if I correct myself. Um, and you can compare any four to look at population. So for instance, if I go into uh, Central America and if I click on a pixel here, it will tell me the, the actual pixel value from each of the four data sets that I have visible. And you can see it varies widely from GPW, which is low and likely an underestimate up through the max value being from Landscape, uh, which is a highly modeled surface. Um, and you can, of course, like I said, switch these out, but uh, and pan and zoom around and look at the population data anywhere, and even zoom in pretty close to see the how the distribution varies, and see the limits of something like GPW based solely on census data. It starts to look just like the census units versus GHS or World Pop or Landscan, or I could switch this out and show um, the high resolution settlement layer. Here it is, the high resolution settlement layer aggregated to one kilometer, so it's directly comparable. And you can see how the distribution looks uh, for these heavily modeled surfaces. And then if you've got a area of interest, let's say we're interested in how many people live in this city, um, you can flip to a comparison view and we'll get a help screen that shows you how to use the comparison view, but I'll leave that closed um, um, for now. And the population data layers that are available are shown here. And we can turn off GPW, and we'll turn our GHS pop, and here it comes up, here's the GHS pop, um, and here's the city, and I could draw a polygon around this city. just roughly estimate that this is the city area. And it will submit that polygon to the server, and I can hide the help because I don't think I need it right now. Um, and right now it's it's taking about 20 seconds or so to process each of these jobs. We're actually working on rolling out uh, new, new servers that should hopefully make this a slightly faster process. But then you get a bar chart showing you the population from all of the uh, data sets available in this area in, from partners in the, the um, Popgrid Collaborative. And you can mouse over and see the total population from each data set. And we can see how it varies from 490,000 all the way up to 1.2 million uh, from Landscan or 1.2 million from, uh, we have two versions of Landscan, 2015 and 2018, um, or one just over a million for, for um, WorldPop. And of course, all these data is a table that you copy and put into a spreadsheet or a report. And um, we've got some data quality me measurements. Uh, the ESRI World Population Estimate has a reliability ranking, uh, and it's ranked at two, and that's documented on, on the data set what those reliability rankings mean, but that's a pretty odd, good reliability rank ranking. HRSL has coverage. It's not global, but it has coverage here where we do the polygon. And our GPW data is using admin units in this area with a, an area, an average area of 433 square kilometers, which is not very detailed. So the GPW estimate is, uh, I strongly suspect, an underestimate. And so you could repeat this exercise from anywhere that you want to do a population estimate by drawing a rectangle or drawing a polygon and getting uh, a good look at the population estimates across. Lots of folks have asked, well, why wouldn't I do this and just average all the population estimates to get a more reliable result? There's two issues with that. The first is that a number of the data sets are using the same census data inputs. That is specifically the data inputs used for greater population in the world, GPW, are used in the HRSL and the GHS POP data set and the WorldPOP data set. 
So the estimates you get uh, for a total that includes a whole or multiple admin units are um, going to be, if you average them, are going to be biased towards the GPW estimate, uh, which may not be ideal if the data for the country in particular um, that you're working in or countries if you're crossing a border are not as reliable. Um, they vary in GPW country by country, and that's documented on the website as well. So here we see for this larger area, the population estimates are, are in closer agreement, um, you know, between 450,000 and 570,000 or so. Um, and you've got the same sort of quality information available for that. So that's a quick look at the pop grid viewer. There are other capabilities. One more I want to show you, uh, but we'll come back to it is the ability to upload a shape file. So next, I was going to take a quick look at QGIS. And here in QGIS, we have um, administrator boundary data for Columbia that I've preloaded. I've even subsetted it and made administrator boundary data just for one area of interest inside of Columbia. Um, and I exported this as a shapefile and zipped it up. So there's a, a shapefile on my, on my hard drive that is just these admin units um, in a zip file. And the, what the pop grid viewer allows you to do is if you click on the shapefile tab, you can choose a zip file that has your shapefile. And here's my zip file with my Columbia admin to subset dot zip. When I open that up, it will validate the, the shape file. And it notes that my shape file contains multiple polygons and it actually merges it into a single polygon, which may be uh, not exactly what I want to do. But here is the result. Here's the polygon that's merged from all those polygons. And you can see we're just north of, uh, um, I think it's just north of, I forget which city, <laughs> um, north of a city in Colombia. Um, and you can see the pop estimates for all these polygons, right? So they vary again from 800,000 to 1.2 million across all the data sets. But if I was interested in pop estimates for each of these individual polygons, um, there's a way to do that as well, but it takes a little more work, but I'll show that. And then the, the next thing I wanted to show you is the ability to look at um, the map services that are behind this directly in QGIS. So here we're looking at the map services. Um, this is the GHS pop for this portion of Columbia. Um, and this is coming off a RTIS server instance. Um, and here's our RTIS server that's available um, from season. And if we go into the um, season folder, there's actually a series of services um, for pop grid. And there is the season pop grid counts map server. So this is a map server that shows us population count layers for each of these. And what I can do simply is copy this URL. And in QGIS, we can make a connection to that URL. So if I go to layers and add a layer, I can add a RTS REST service layer, server layer. And that's just what I was looking at in the web browser was the REST interface for RTS server. So I'm going to make a new connection. Um, I'll call it PopGrid. And I'll paste in that URL that I copied. And that's all it takes to get access to the layers. And so now with PopGrid, I can click Connect. And it connects, and it shows me all the layers on the server. Um, and so I can go and add those to my map. So I'm going to add the GHS pop count, uh, the GPW uh, 2015 count, the HRSL count, Landscan 2018, and the World Pop 2015 count. I'll add those in, and they show up with the legends. Although, because my um, using the darks theme, the the legend itself doesn't show up. And the first thing I'm going to do is actually turn them all off um, and start with the GPW layer. Hopefully, it will redraw for me. There it is. So if you look at the admin units that I'm using here, they're from um, GeoBoundaries. You can see that they actually match the census units that were used in GPW to do that proportional allocation. 
So doing a sum here would just give me the total pop per admin unit based on the GPW census pop, which is not necessarily a terrible thing. Um, but um, more interesting is looking at some of the other distributions. If we look at the HRSL, and especially if you're using uh, units other than the admin units, you can see a lot of variability in the distribution within the admin units that I've got here. Um, so if you're using a, a different than the, um, the census admin units, you get a much different picture. Uh, and then LandScan um, shows you a different picture yet again uh, compared to the HRSL and, and GPW. Uh, and it's got a much um, more heterogeneous prediction. One of the things I, I should mention about LandScan is um, one of the prime reasons you may be interested in using LandScan is that they predict what they call ambient population density. So GPW and HRSL and anything that's based on a top-down census approach um, is essentially using census data, which is where people live or where they sleep, nighttime population distribution. LandScan uses census data, but they use larger admin units and rely on the model to distribute people across uh, both commercial, industrial, and, and residential areas. So you get an average population that accounts somewhat for how people move about during the day or week. Uh, the world pop uh, model is is smoother than the other ones, but it does show you know these peak densities um, that really are more realistic um, estimates than the simple GPW. And so that's how you can use the the layers without having to download and visualize all of these data layers yourself from inside QGIS or ArcGIS if you're an Esri user. You can of course access these services and 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 uh, visualize the data. And then the final thing I wanted to show um, in our demos here is I stood up on GitHub. So this this is a public GitHub repo. Um, and if we go just to the, to the root, here's the URL you can use to get just to this public um, repo. And it's a demonstration of getting estimates for each of these um, layers. So here's my the same subset file, right? I recognize these from um, from QGIS, this is just north of Bogota, um, these admin units. And there is a Jupyter notebook uh, here that demonstrates how without GIS and without any additional modules, just straight up Python, um, we can lob a request at our server and get um, a population estimate for all of the polygons, individual polygons. So if I follow that link, we can see that the the, the server service takes this um, type of input, which is a polygon. It only accepts one polygon at a time. And variables, that is the layers you want to uh, get population sums for. And statistics, you can get the sum and or the mean. And a request ID, which is just a unique identifier. Um, so if I go to the live version of this Jupyter no Notebook, which I'm running on my laptop, if you're familiar with Python, this should look familiar. If you're not, I wouldn't worry about it too much because uh, we can't parse all of this Python in a short demo. But I can import these libraries, which are standard libraries that come with uh, any modern Python install. And I can open that Columbia JSON file. And I just, haha, this is the way live demos go. Um, it's in the data subfolder. So I can import those libraries and then read in the JSON file. And we can see that the JSON file um, has types, uh, has a type, a name, a coordinate reference system, and features. And the features are the polygons that we saw for Columbia. And then this largest block of code essentially sets up a container to hold the results. And then for every feature, I build a request that is very similar, actually pretty much identical, except the coordinates are different, to this request, example request here, where I give it the coordinates, I tell it I want the GHS population count, the sum, and the mean. And that's what this block does in a loop for every feature in the input file. It makes that request. 
I then, actually, this is the bit of code that makes the request. And then the request is returned, and I handle the output. And if there's an error, it's going to print error. Otherwise, for each admin unit, it tells me that the request was successful. And it looks like we're getting we're, we're hitting the server at a good time. It's not overloaded because all the requests are um, successful. So I can look at the output for one particular request. This is the unique identifier uh, that I supplied and see that I get a response uh, data type. Uh, most useful is our short title. It's, this is the land scan population count for 2015, which is what I requested. The unit in persons and the mean. And here's the sum. I, I, I overlooked the sum. So for this particular admin unit, it's estimating that there's uh, 13,000 people according to Landscan. Um, I can then pull out the totals, just the, the sum. So I'm just pulling out the sum from all results and plot it. So here's a histogram uh, across all the admin units showing uh, the population and the number of units that fall in that bin. More useful might be just a simple bar chart. Um, and I can plot that with just three lines of code. So here's each of the admin units and the population estimate uh, from landscape for each of those units. I could save this out and open it in Excel or join it back to my shape file or feature class in QGIS and map with it or do whatever I like. So a really simple demonstration on how to use basic Python to get results from our server. And this is the same service that I demonstrated for drawing a single polygon in the web and seeing the results. So I'm going to finish the demos, uh, or I've finished the demos, and I'm going to go back to PowerPoint and continue on uh, with the presentation. So to discuss some application areas for population grids, um, there's a list here on the left that shows us common applications, hazard exposure, exposure to um, high, uh, potentially uh, high impact earthquake areas, uh, modeled flood surfaces, uh, areas that could be exposed to drought, any type of hazard, it could be a technological hazard as well. Um, can You can use greater population to take that a regular area of higher um, hazard risk and estimate the number of people that reside inside that area. Um, there's a really common use case for health service delivery, including things like vaccines, uh, delivery of polio uh, vaccines in Africa, Ebola vaccines, as you use greater population data to, to estimate the number of vaccines needed and the, the labor force to deliver them, and even down to um, routing uh, in combination with street networks to, to reach the maximum population uh, efficiently using grid population road networks and, and known transport modes. Uh, it's also been used for health facility planning, looking at existing health facility uh, areas and, and estimating how many people can be reached within a certain time period from the existing health facility and identifying gaps, uh, places where health facilities, additional health facilities should be placed to cover more population. Uh, monitoring um, of population change for things like the sustainable development goals, as some of the data sets have a time series or, and many are produced on an ongoing basis. You can look at change over time for some of, from some of them. Uh, there's been lots of commercial applications uh, from planning cell phone networks or even just looking at uh, the potential market for cell phones or other services. Greater population has been used for that. And it's been used in human environment research for a long time. Um, so some examples here at the just below, we have what's um, a global study known as the, the low elevation coastal zone that was produced at, at season, where we took SRTM derived, uh, the shuttle radar topographic mission uh, elevations. And we took that global elevation surface and found all the areas that are adjacent to the coast uh, in different bands of low elevation, zero to three meters, four to seven, five to 10, or greater than 10 was left out of the study. And then we could calculate the total population in each of those low elevation coastal zone bands by country uh, or globally or by continent. So here's a map of the population density. This is this is um, the Nile Delta 
uh, where it enters the Mediterranean Sea. It might be difficult to read, but that's a, a line pointing out Alexandria. And the the gist of the of the data set is that you can uh, systematically assess globally, internationally, uh, the population that lives in the low elevation coastal zone that may be um, may be exposed to potential impacts from sea level rise or more frequent storms, uh, so coastal flooding events. Um, here on the right, we've got, um, this is a link to a story map um, that shows you different ways you can measure SDG 9.1.1, an indicator that, that measures the uh, rural population access to roads. So we took different population data sets and different subsets of roads data sets for Africa um, and computed the proportion of population that had access to all weather roads uh, by admin unit. You, the, so the grid, of, the grid of population were used for the estimate and we aggregated it up. So in red, you can see essentially are the admin units that have a relatively high uh, index value for the, the population not having access, the rural population not having access to roads. And so the story map walks through the different methods and the different data sets used to produce it um, for uh, Northern Africa. But we're actually working on producing that data set globally um, so that SDG 911 can be compared across countries at a subnational level uh, um, globally. And as new population data sets are released, new graded data sets that are, that are suitable, and new roads updates are made to roads data sets, we can rerun the global analysis and track change over time. That's due to actual change in population and roads and somewhat due to you know, improvements in the data sets. And then finally, I wanted to show some um, an older paper. This is by Small and Cohen. Um, Chris Small is a researcher at uh, the Lamont campus at Columbia and, and Joel Cohen is a, a researcher uh, in the, the uh, population center uh, on the main campus at Columbia University. Uh, but this was work done in 2004 with gridded population in the world, just looking at basic distribution of human population uh, across your surface. And the takeaway from this, this graphic on, on the left, this plot on the left, is that if you look here, uh, the percentage of population, um, about two thirds of the world's population lives on less than 5% of the Earth's inhabitable surface. Um, so we are really a clustered population distribution. The larger plot shows you the global distribution, and you can see that as you get up to about two-thirds population, you're somewhere over um, uh, just 5% of the world's um, surface. And this is done with um, GPW just by adding up um, where the densest populations live compared to the total land area. Um, so inhabitable land areas uh, just simply land surface area that isn't permanently snow, ice, or water. So a, a pretty simple uh, assumption there. And then it was repeated for distance from permanent rivers um, by altitude, uh, that is elevation above sea level, and distance to sea coasts. And so you can see that people generally live, if you look here, the, the sum of population, most people live close to a river um, at low elevations, or close to a coast um, going across. Everything shows a descent. The exception here are some high altitude cities like Mexico City that caused this spike around 2000 meters. Uh, but again, the majority of the population lives um, close to permanent rivers um, at lower elevations and close, close to the coast. And these assumptions are built into um, some of the uh, Desimetric and and more advanced machine learning models because things like distance to river, distance to coast, and raw elevation are included in the model parameters. And this is why, because people are associated, uh, residential population is associated with these phenomena. And then finally, um, some remote sensing derived climate norms, temperature and precipitation, um, can be. You can do the same sort of analysis and look at where people live according to average annual temperature, and you see a spike. Most people living um, within uh, a range of average temperature of 10 to 20 degrees Celsius. Um, and here, the same plot against annual range, you see the range varies more. Uh, and if you look at precipitation, most people are living in areas you know, that get 800 or 
so millimeters or more. Um, and then in very wet areas, the population actually uh, tails off. And then if you look at the variability of precipitation, more people live in areas that have more variable um, precipitation, uh, which is not a surprise when you look at human distribution. Uh, you see a lot of variability in temperate areas, which is uh, where a lot of the population lives. Temperate and subtropical areas have a lot of annual var variation in, in precipitation. That's where most people live. So that's um, the end of my section on, on the tour of uh, population data. Um, so, Stefan, I'm going to hand it back to you and uh, let you go on with uncertainty and fitness for use. Thanks. Thank you so much, Greg, for this excellent overview. Um, I think uh, this was a, a great overview of different applications and how to really work with the population data in the web viewer. Thank you very much. And um, I want to conclude this presentation uh, with some words on data uncertainty and fitness for use. These population grids um, are a very special kind of data as um, everybody will experience when they are downloading them and looking at them and comparing them. PopGrid has been investing quite a little bit in intercomparison frameworks. And that basically means to take all the different data sets and compare them. You can or you could see this already in some of the examples that Greg was describing um, to basically take the different population grids for the same target application and see what you find. And it's really interesting to see different trends, typical patterns, see a relationship to the underlying scale, for example. And all this has been reported in quite some research already and uh, needs to be collected systematically to better understand what kind of data are used in what way and what are the general trends that different people see repeatedly. That's a very effective strategy to better understand what is the implication of using certain data sets. Here's one example um, from 2019 um, to Holsky et al. on the total population by settlement size for Africa. You can see in this case the four population grids that are compared here show very interesting patterns. The user after seeing these is then um, you know, probably very interested in understanding a little bit more. Why do I see these trends? Why do I see these radical differences? And it would be always a good idea to explore some of the reasons why that might be and what data sets seem to be a appropriate or an appropriate solution for your target applications and which do you have to treat with a little bit more of, of um, some care. Validation efforts in and of themselves for population grids are very difficult. They can be done and are done and will be done in, in more frequent ways um, wherever we have high quality data available. That's really important to understand a little bit more about the, the real accuracy of these grid population distributions. However, for many countries, obviously, these ground truth data or reference data are not existing because we begin with a problem of highly aggregated census data, poor data coverage, um, if any data at all for a long time period. So we always will have this effect and this um, central problem of not being able to validate the data themselves for large regions where they are actually being applied. However, the inter comparison strategy is a very effective one to at least understand how the data behave for different target applications and at different scales for different regions, for local applications, etc. A very effective approach to evaluate the data a little bit more in depth is the so-called concept of fitness for use. Here we are trying to use the context of target applications to better understand what are the data used for? Is it an appropriate use? Should the user be careful about it? We basically want to inform the user about forms and appropriate uncertainty aware use. The concept of relative data quality, or as we call it, fitness for use, um, describes how we can assess the appropriateness of a given data set for an intended purpose, as I mentioned. Important is to guide and inform the user community while they're making informed decisions, or at least make sure they can do informed decisions um, by better understanding the aspects of accuracy. And we're talking about spatial, thematic, and temporal accuracy of these data um, in relation to the intended use. And that's exactly the key of this kind of concept. Um, it's very important to understand what kind of input population data am I using. 
the remember Greg was showing you the input data being used can be of very different qualities. It's very important for the user to be aware of what exactly are the input population data that I'm using. The modeling assumptions behind the products. It's very important to understand, is this a heavily or highly intense modeled data product, or is this underlying very simple and simplistic um, assumptions of just proportional fitting, for example? And third, we have ancillary data that we're using, and the user needs to be aware of what these kinds of data really are and what they have to be concerned about and um, should be um, taken into the interpretation of their results. So data aspects and relative quality, to begin with that, um, there's aggregation effects. I talked about this for quite some time. That's really important. What are the aggregations of input data? Now I'm talking about the population data. But also, what are the mismatches um, between different data, population data and ancillary data, for example? And what is the inherent variation? Can I even estimate the inherent variation of these data? I might use different qualities of input data, population, or ancillary in different regions in different countries. So this boils down to the questions of scale, of currency, um, how much in time or how much temporal overlap is there between the data, and semantics. What kind of populations are actually modeled? Greg mentioned there are different target populations for different data products that can be modeled, and the user has to decide what kind of population is the target population in my application. And back to scale, one more illustration of something that I've um, mentioned before. Whenever we are using census data, we have this high aggregation of, um, you know, underlying an assumption of equal population density anywhere within that unit, which we know now is unrealistic. Now, we can choose from different data products that are available, for example, GPW, um, for example, WorldPOP, or for example, um, GHSPOP, or any other layer that we might be interested in. Here we go. So it's really important to, um, to understand the differences, to understand what the data really are displaying per grid cell, what is the underlying spatial resolution, and how does this relate to my target application scale. There's an operation in scale at which I'm assuming my target variable or my process I'm trying to model, be it, for example, for natural hazard risk exposure or be it for accessibility to water resources, where I would like to have population grids that are as close as possible to that so-called operation in scale. Very often I have analytical scales that are coming with the spatial resolution of these data, and the user has to decide, is that an appropriate scale or is my scale, my resolution too coarse to actually work at this operation scale? And finally, the processing and model related implications of uncertainty, data integration frameworks, population allocation methods, as we describe them here in this um, session, they have consequences. And depending on the modeling intensity, I might have robust estimates, um, but I might also not be able to make good statements about the quality of these estimates. They are still at very fine resolution, but based on the input data and based on ancillary data available, the estimates might actually have high local errors. So these are all aspects that the user needs to be um, aware of and find ways of how to evaluate this. Are there really large deviations and differences when I'm using different population data and what might be a reason? Also, there's the effect of uncertainty propagation. If I'm using complicated models, um, complex data processing procedures, well, I'm basically creating uncertainty at different ends of my analytical chain. And I would like to understand what is the propagation of this uncertainty um, to my final and target application. Finally, our ancillary data we mentioned before, it's really important to understand um, what ancillary data have been used. Have there been used, for example, road networks or um, not at all? What about um, streams? What about other really important eleva um, elevation data, for example, that we mentioned before? And uh, what is their quality? For example, the underlying map scale of road networks and, and hydrography. Or what is the completeness and resolution of underlying ancillary data, for example, settlement that I'm using for spatial refinement of my population estimates? Um, all these are important aspects that 
feed into the quality, into the relative quality estimates that I have to make in terms of is my application a reasonable and an appropriate application um, for the population data set for the gridded population layer that I'm intending to use. Based on these kinds of insights, we um, try to formulate some interesting questions that um, we believe will help the user community to inform themselves and um, to be better instructed on these critical aspects of the data that they have to take in, into account while downloading the data, using the data, and uh, following through and um, trying to carry out their projects and target applications. For example, how important is spatial refinement of the population grid to be used? Do you really need a 100 meter resolution or is your um, target application a, of different nature? Do you just need a regional level, a regional scale um, being applied there? Different data sets might come into mind and might be appropriate to be used. Does the analysis focus on urban populations? A very important question because many and three variables in many different countries would have higher quality in urban settings naturally. Rural settings are very often more problematic because the census data are sparser or they are more incomplete, as well as the units might be much larger than in urban areas that I'm using as input population data. What is the target population for the question at hand? Of course, um, as Greg mentioned, there are different target populations that are modeled in these different products, and the user might make a good decision or being interested even in testing these different target populations because this might inform their application as well. Is the population grid being used to model other outcomes? That's really important. Greg mentioned this as well. Um, you have to be aware of what ancillary data have been going in to these different population grids. For example, if road density has been used to desymmetrical refined population counts, um, you should not try to analyze road density or road related variables in your target application. Finally, are you analyzing change over time? Um, as mentioned before, there are different population grids that are available for different points in time. Others, not so much, they cover different points in times. And of course, the multi-temple um, nature of these population grids might be different as well. They might depend on each other, they might have some temple interpolation processes inherent, or they are completely independent. All these are aspects that um, might be important for your target application. The final one, how have these data sets been used previously? And we believe this is a very important one, especially while more and more application examples will be published in the scientific and applied um, research communities and outlets, where users and potential users can see more and more examples of how these different population groups have been used in the past. And hopefully um, they will refer to peer reviewed um, and, and uh, reliable studies and analysis where we have some quality control that different users have thought about this. And the more critical users there are out there um, of using and using these data sets, um, the, the better informed novel users and potential users will be in the near future. With these concluding words, um, the last thing I want to uh, mention is this um, publication that we produced um, in the name of the PopGrid um, Data Collaborative. You can see many of the members of the PopGrid group are co-authors on this publication, Earth System Science Data, which is basically um, the publication of much of the content that we produce and that we um, that we presented here today um, as a second source for those who are interested in understanding more and reading more and finding more um, reference sources about these methodological frameworks and applications at hand. Find a short bibliography here at the end and find more in information in some of these publications. With this, we would like to thank you very much and um, in, in the name of our team, um, appreciate much your attention. Thank you. And with this, um, we will now transition to our question and answer session and we're more than happy to answer um, any questions we might and uh, are very interested in your opinions and very interested in your potential applications. Thank you very much. Okay, we will be transitioning to the question and answer session. Thank you very much, Stefan 
and Greg. That was a very detailed session about uh, an introduction to these population grids. Um, so we have been transferring the questions that have been asked throughout the session over to this question and answer document. Uh, please keep typing your questions as we go through these. Um, so without further ado, I guess I'll just start off with the first one here and I'll leave this to either Greg or Stefan or Susanna, uh, whoever is most appropriate to speak to these answers. Um, I'll start off with the first one. Question one, may I know the difference of this between uh, and CDAC? <clears throat> Hi Brock, I can I can take that. Yeah, CDAC is is the NASA funded data center that is operated by Season, and it participates in the Pop Grid Collaborative. Um, um, but it's um, it's not um, a, it it provides resources to support uh, the Pop Grid Collaborative, including the website. But the the collaborative is of course a member based organization that that's coordinated by. Uh, three of the partners, as, as Stefan mentioned. Great, thank you. Uh, question two, is there a method to extract a specific area of gridded data and regrid the area, the small area using Python? I guess I'll take this one again since I did the Python demo. Um, yeah, it's, it's possible um using python libraries either arcpy if you're an esri user or qgis python libraries or something like shapely and fiona which lets you work with geometries and raster io that works with um, raster data um, and it's possible just inside of desktop gis as well and the general approach would be to extract the population from the grid or grids for the polygons of interest and then Regrid at your chosen resolution by by a simple um, well, there's there's two methods to do it, but essentially the, the general one is convert the 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 polygon to raster pixels and count the number of pixels and multiply it by the density, and you get an area estimate for each pixel. Additionally, you likely want to at least use dasymmetric. Uh, weights from other layers, or you could use machine learning approaches or other models to predict population and then regrid the, the totals from the grid from the existing global products. It's been done several times by different groups. Um, the other way to do it is, of course, take the vector of um, census data and, and grid that at a different resolution. But I can provide more details offline. Uh, it's, it's quite a lot of detail to get into in the code. Understandably, thank you. Um, number three, could you be a little bit more specific about missing people in the census? Yeah, I can I can help answering that question quickly. Um, it's uh, it's well known that there are different levels of error in different population censuses, um, which this basically means is we are trying to enumerate the target population in different countries, but the coverage is very different, very often not 100%. So that's one of the arguments to be made in there. Um, the users can see more information in some of the publications that um, that we indicate in, in our presentation, in our bibliography. Um, of course, there are also reasons such as limited accessibility, there are conflicts in different countries. It's very important to realize these are global grids and the coverage temporarily and regionally can be very different across countries. And that's what was meant about um, missing parts of the population at different time periods for different countries. Great, thank you very much, Stefan. Um, question four, what is the resolution of the grids? And I'm guessing they're talking about spatial resolution um, and the accuracy levels of the data. Yeah, so um, the resolution varies from the most detailed being the HRSL at one arc second or approximately 30 meters uh, all, all the way up to um, 30 arc seconds with also products at 100 meters, 150 meters and 250 meters approximate resolutions. So it, it varies quite a bit by product. Um, and for uncertainty, uh, we've done Inner comparison of different products uh, to look at 
how reliable they are compared often compared to each other or a separate more detailed uh, source of data like um, census data inputs where they're uh, available uh, which is not everywhere of course uh, to come up with relative with numeric and relative measures of how how the different products qualify but there's no one reliability measure uh, I think we've got another question on um, on reliability where um, I talk about some of the products, GPW, um, WorldPop, and uh, the Esri um, World Population Estimate all have pixel level quantitative measures of uh, reliability that are not the same, but um, give you a, a per pixel measure of the relative reliability of the data products that you can use in your analysis. Okay, and question five, how frequent is the data updated considering the fact that different countries conduct their population and housing censuses at different years? Yeah, so I, I had to go with this answer as well. So it, it does vary a lot by data set. GPW is probably the least frequently updated because it's reliant on the census, which is typically uh, decennial rounds of censuses that happen around you know, 2010, 2011, and then are happening now, 2020, 21, with sometimes estimates um, um, or census data being released, you know, in odd years. Uh, but we tend to do roughly every five years a big update of GPW. Uh, then other products like the Esri product and the HRSL are done annually or biannually, uh, along with um, LandScan, which is done annually as well. And one of the reasons you see more frequent updates is not because there's new census data globally, uh, although uh, they may be able to take advantage of updated census releases for some countries. It's because the remote sensing derived and other uh, input variables um, that they use in their models are updated much more frequently than the census, so they can, they can um, uh, show change based on the other variables, if not the census. And also, they can, um, they often uh, improve methodologies uh, between releases. So both the ESRI and the LandScan data are produced fairly frequently, but um, each edition is not directly comparable with the previous edition because there's often, or there's always been to date, updates in the methodologies. So the two data sets are not directly comparable. Uh, so you can't do a change product, for instance, even though they're produced fairly frequently. Great, yeah, that was a great question. I'm sure a lot of people had this uh, same sort of question. So thank you for explaining that. Um, and this kind of goes into what you were discussing in question four about reliability. What is the simplest method for grid reliability analysis? Right, yeah. So as I mentioned um, in the previous question, um, some, of the, some of the data products publish reliability measures on a per pixel basis. So um, for all of these, you can, for example, do a, a zonal statistics like I showed in the, the web application where you get those quality measures, those reliability measures, just by drawing a polygon. You could do that in your GIS or in code as well, or just via the website. And it tells you, for instance, with GPW, you know, the higher, the, the lower the mean admin level, um, admin level unit size that's in the area you're interested in, the more reliable it is. And with the Esri um, uh, reliability measure, it's a, it's a dimensionless index, one to 10, and you can, you can just use that as a relative measure of the, the reliability measure there. And then with WorldPop, they have a, a standard deviation. So you could even multiply your standard deviation by your population estimate or, or simulate a 95% probability distribution of your estimate with WorldPop data um, and, and see what your error bars are on that data. And then finally, there's several papers that are linked here that, that um, estimate uh, the reliability or, or describe the, the differences in reliability across the grid of products by comparing with more detailed or, or see Stefan's paper um, uh, from 2019 for a, for a good summary of all this. Great, thank you. And it, it looks like that reliability um, validation uh, kind of goes into question seven as well. And I just wanna say that uh, I posted these links to the articles in the chat box, and we will, within about a week, 
um, we're just going to clean up this Q&A document for accuracy. So you'll have all these links to use as a resource um, to download off our training web page in a PDF format uh, within the coming week. So um, we will make this available to everybody as well. So if there's anything you wanted to say to expand upon that in question seven, if not, we can just move on to question eight, if you like. I can I can maybe just very quickly, uh, because it's such an important topic, and uh, I'm, I'm actually really glad to see these questions about validation, about reliability. It shows us that, that everybody's thinking about these criteria right away when, we, when they think about the target application. So um, thank you for this attention. Um, Validation of these grids obviously is, is a big challenge and is one of the central working parts um, of many members of PopGrid to think about this. How can we better evaluate um, the quality of these grids? Um, validation itself is, is always hard because you need reference data that you can use for direct comparison. Um, these intercomparison experiments that are going on um, in the literature at the moment, there are quite some publications out in the meantime, are very interesting because they show the difference, they show the sensitivity, they show trends um, depending on the target application. And that's exactly the reason why this framework of fitness for use is so important to really understand um, the relative quality of the data. So the user really needs to be informed about what they are using, what kind of data they are, have their hands on, and uh, how to correctly apply them to the target applications. Great, thank you very much, Stefan. And you're right, this that that is a, a big topic. So it is nice to see those addressed in the beginning of the Q and A session here. Um, question eight, and this is a little bit more on the application side. Um, could you provide some examples on how pop grid data could be used for climate change adaptation or mitigation? Uh, in addition to the report, um, um, which gives you a lot of good uses of the population data, there, uh, there's more recent work done um, on modeling population movement uh, in 2030 and 2050 based on drivers due to climate change. And this is uh, released in a report called Groundswell Report. And I can add a link in before we release the um, the document. So it's, it's showing areas that are more likely to attract um, population and areas that are likely to see out migration due to um, both climate change factors and other, uh, other drivers of population migration uh, over the longer time frame. So it's, it's an interesting look at, it doesn't um, directly suggest migration, but it's our um, mitigation, but it's it's interesting in that it shows the future patterns that are possible uh, that, that you need to understand before you can do mitigation. Yeah, great. Um, and I posted this leaving no one off the map link into the chat window as well. And um, for that you referenced or the report, uh, we'll make sure to include that here too. It sounds very interesting. Yeah, it's called um, grounds, ground swell. Uh, yeah, ground at least swell. By, by season and, and the World Bank. And right. yeah. uh, we get this question a lot uh, involving Google Earth Engine. Can the population data be used through Google Earth Engine? Yeah, so I, I added this in because we published GPW uh, into Google Earth Engine, and I know GHS POP has been published in Google Earth Engine, as well as World POP. So there's three of the data sets we talked about today that are available there. Um, and the HRSL is not currently available, but we're actually working with um, Facebook and, and need to reach out to the Google Earth Engine folks, but we hope to put it in. Um, the other data sets are often not in Google Earth Engine as, as public data sets because they have some licensing restrictions that are not suitable for use with Google Earth Engine. I don't want to, I can't speak on Google's behalf, of course, but this is my understanding of why not all the data sets are available. But for most cases, it doesn't stop you if you're not aware in Google Earth Engine. You can upload and use your own data sets um, via a couple different ways. So it's possible to do that um, with um, the other data sets that aren't pub publicly available. And I can actually add a link to documentation on how to do that in Earth Engine if you're an Earth Engine user. I just thought of that now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Thank you. And I think question 10 uh, was a little bit related to question five, which was answered pretty thoroughly. So we'll move on to question 11. Um, I wonder what population information is used in these global data sets if countries do not have updated census data. So how do you estimate the population with this level of granularity? And uh, what is the interval of confidence at the block level data? Yeah, maybe I can, I can take this away quickly. Um, of course, the, the quality of these population grid estimates always depends on the input data and the main input data source are census data. So this is a great question um, and, uh, and again shows us that, that users think about this a lot. And uh, maybe you've seen this in Greg's demo that when you look at um, population estimates coming from the population grids for different areas, you can see the input data and you can see the timestamps of um, what time the input data are from. So basically the, the time the census data has been collected and that's really important to understand the currency of data. Um, of course, if the census data are older going in as input data, um, you have to be aware of this before you use the population grids for your target application. Um, what I want to say is um, I'm, I'm hoping more and more that the research on population forecast and population projection will find its way more into population grid applications as well, because that's exactly um, one way of accounting for, for these deviations in currency that you are able to, to project population more to up-to-date estimates. Um, but at the moment, the, the user has to be very careful when using data with um, or that is created using input data, census data that is outdated. Great, thank you. Um, question 12, um, it's, presumably it's dependent on how often the sensor is run. For example, in the UK, every 10 years, would that be about right? And it looks like the, that's kind of related to a question before about uh, how often some of this is updated. Yeah, yeah, some countries do five-year intercensal estimates, um, but roughly every 10 years. Um, so, yeah, and then there are some countries that even have an annual registry approach to census data, but they're, they're not the majority. But in that case, they actually have annual up updates to um, population distribution based on a registry rather than a census. So it does vary um, depending on the country you're looking at, but the majority is a decennial census uh, to date. Question 13, and this is referring to future estimates um, rather than just population counts. Um, it looks like uh, they're just looking for the different, if the grid methodology takes into account future estimates. Um, yeah, I think I think that um, a number of the existing products are, are technically feature estimates. So I talked about the Groundswell report modeled out to 2030, 2050. Um, the data products that are currently you know, released for 2020 are generally predictions rather than based on the 2020 census. Um, and if, if you're interested in variables other than population counts, of course, age and sex um, have been done, but you can actually predict, um, you can use similar gridded modeling approach to predict many different variables. It's been used, I know, to predict GDP per pixel, for instance. So the amount of the proportion of um, gross domestic product in dollars purchase power parity, if you're familiar with that measure, per pixel has been predicted using methods similar to what's used in some of the population models. And pretty much any any variable on an administrative unit that's a count-based variable could be could be approached in the same method where you look at the covariates or or a simple Isometric or or aerial weighting method to distribute whatever count data you have on administrative units to pixels. It's possible for any any of those types of variables. Yeah, maybe to add quickly on on the idea of projections. Um, I know that some research groups and we are, are working on some uh, population projection work that actually uses, um, for example, the degree of urbanization and and population grids in combination to um, to provide uh, to create these kinds of projections um, over several decades and see um, how these projections um, play out under different uh, socioeconomic pathway scenarios. 
So there is research on the way that takes up these population groups for these kinds of, um, you know, you, you can almost call it one of the applications to project you know, population and to forecast population trends over large regions and even globally. Um, so our hope obviously is that these data are being used for, for many such purposes to improve these projections as well. Question 14, and this seems to be a little bit more regional, um, but you referred to Facebook um, population data in one of the data sets, and somebody was asking if it's available for the Mekong region yet. Um, I'm going to post this link in the chat box so you can see it. What it looks like it is a reference to see where the population data sets are currently available for Facebook. Question 15, urban areas have multi-story buildings with varying family sizes. Moreover, commercial buildings operating around the clock with few employees will also consider density. How reliable could these estimates be and how do you adjust coefficients for different types of built up areas? Interesting. Oh, sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> um, so the the urban built up and multi-story buildings aren't well accounted for unless it's um, unless the census data are detailed. So the present products typically use you know uh, either a simple settlement extent or sometimes this this the use of lights at night from satellite drive measures helps get at this. Uh, because the more built up an area is, the more well lit it tends to be. Um, and that's one of the covariates used in in, in population modeling. Uh, and then there's more research, recent work underway to look at um, the volume of buildings from radar derived data, but it's not integrated in any global or regional products that I know of right now. Um, uh, but uh, I think we're going to see that approach much more common as more and more um, settlement extent data that has more details. Um, so what we've seen to date is WorldPOP and, and HRSL, both um, some of the newer iterations of WorldPOP use a building count based on footprints where it's available, which is not everywhere. So you get a density of buildings based on count, which doesn't account for really tall buildings, but uh, it does help um, look at you know more households possible in areas with more buildings. And then as we add for urban areas building volume, then you'll definitely see a more refined model for urban areas. This is less applicable in more rural areas where most buildings are one or two stories. Okay, and question 16. This seems like a, uh, a nice uh, prelude to uh, part two, where we start to talk about some of these disaster risk reduction efforts using population grids. How can I use pop grid to compare with natural disasters like floods and fires? What is the most appropriate data set to do that? Yeah, I started answering this question. Um, this, this is one of the of one very important target application. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to see these questions. Um, we just, you know, it's really a central domain where these population grids can be can be and should be applied. Um, which one is most reliable is always a question of, of what exactly are you trying to do? Is it a regional approach, very local? And you have to decide what quality you need in your population estimates. What is the spatial resolution? Again, what's your operational scale, for example? Um, I provide somewhere a link. I don't really see the question in front of me right now um, to the to the low coastal um, Elevation so a low elevation coastal zone um, literature. There are quite a few publications. We will update a few more of these because this is one of the classic examples of uh, estimating how many people are actually living in coastal zones and uh, what is the potential and um, what is the potential size of the population um, affected by sea level rise in the near future, for example. This is just one example. And again, you can do this globally and can make estimates um, for very large areas relatively quickly um, based on different input data, or you can transfer this to a very local um, extent where you might want to use other data sets, other data products for population estimates um, if you are aware of the underlying quality and so on. Um, so in short, it truly really depends on 
the quality of the data here, how is the data being uh, produced, what kind of ancillary data went in there, how regional do you see the, the estimates that you can find in these different population groups. Question 17, what is the name of the same project for the buildings? Um, I guess you reference a, a project that had to do with, with, with building and structures? Um, well, the, the, there are two projects on the use building structures or, or at least detected building presence or absence. And one's the high resolution sentiment layer from Facebook, uh, which uses the detailed um, uh, formerly Digital Globe, now Maxar imagery uh, to detect buildings. And then WorldPop, um, where it's available, uses building counts as an input covariate. And it's not available universally. Um, it's available for a number of countries in Africa and then from uh, something like uh, OpenStreetMap, or not something like directly from OpenStreetMap, they use building footprints where they exist, which is a pretty, I think, uh, inconsistent availability and, and low, low percentage coverage globally. This might also refer to, to a slight, slightly different approach. For example, GHSL is a settlement layer that is one of the inputs for, or the input for GHS pop where it's more um, conceptualized as the build up areas um, to refine basically where population has to be allocated to what kind of places, what kind of locations. And it looks like question 18, there was great interest in the uh, web map server demo that you did uh, connecting through QGIS and they had asked for the link. I believe the link is in the, the the PDF for the presentation, but we added it here as well, and I added that to the chat. Question 19, is it possible to obtain estimated population counts by gender? Yeah, there's um, three products that have age and sex breakdowns both, uh, typically five-year age breakdowns. Uh, and age by sex, so it's not available for all countries. It's available for most of the world in WorldPop, GPW4, and the high resolution settlement layer. Great, thank you. And there was a, just an interest behind the, the teams that were behind PopGrid. And I know you addressed this a little bit in the beginning of your presentation, um, but it looks like you described it a little bit more here as well. Uh, just the teams behind PopGrid. Yeah, and and I would mention uh, the PopGrid website often um, lists um, events that we may different members of PopGrid may be um, meeting at, such as sessions at the American Geophysical Union, the American Association of Geographers, the European Forum on Geography and Statistics, uh, and other other uh, international or U.S. based conferences often have um, different. Pop grid members attending and sometimes an organized pop grid session like at AGU and AAG. And they're 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 typically advertised on the pop grid website or the pop grid um, mailing list, which is noted on the website as well. Is that a listserv that one can just sign up for? Um, I believe it might be an invite only. I'd have to check. Sorry, Brock. Maybe I shouldn't have. Okay. <laughs> Oh, and is there a Twitter account associated with the PopGrid Collective? Collaborative? Not as far as I know, no. Uh, question twenty. That's a good idea. <laughs> question twenty-one, and this seems to uh, really get into the details of the modeling. Um, what is the criteria in choosing the models, the aerial or disymmetric? Yeah, I. I had to go in and answer with this, and I and I included machine learning as well as as aerial and dasymetric. And the most important thing is is how you intend to use the population surface. So machine learning approaches are less useful for inference, where you're trying to look at you know why population is distributed as it is, but really useful for um, um, fine tuning a model. Um, another big factor is how many input variables you want to use. Uh, or have access to to use. So, um, you know, aerial is the simplest model and requires the fewest 
inputs. So you can get away with just census data, or you could add barriers like settlement extent and, and water uh, or permanent ice, uh, which is the approach we take in GPW, where it's just water and permanent ice and census data. Uh, then you can, with days of metric, um, one of the advantages, you don't need to train a model. You're, you're building a model based on weights and assumptions. Um, while machine learning approaches require training data, that is, you know, ground truth validation data, which can be costly in terms of time and funds to um, acquire and use. And um, finally, I would note that, um, you know, the, the implementation and the computing resources required uh, go up as the, the model complexity goes up. So you require more computing resources, more data inputs, and more knowledge of, of the, the different uh, model approaches. So all those factors apply um, to selecting your model, along with also, um, you know, the intended audience. So a really simple model or simple global analysis is fine. But if you're trying to get very detailed distribution regionally or subnationally, you probably want to use a more sophisticated model and more data inputs. Yeah, and maybe I can quickly add here. Um, it's it's a very complex topic, and uh, the the, um, the readers will refer to some of the publications that we mentioned. Our ESSD paper has quite some resources in there. Um, there are some really um, interesting survey papers on this genetic mapping and error on population in general. Um, and of course, some of the newer papers from the pop grid um, collaborate with different members, they describe more details um, of their machine learning approaches and how they train these different models, as well as some of the differences between uh, models of different intensity. We mentioned this a um, couple of times in our presentation, this model intensity is a really important um, criterion because um, a highly intense model, if you will, a complex model um, is um, has to be used with some care if you have not the training data or not the input data that would warrant um, the, the use of the data as in, in different cases where you have a relatively simple um, error weighted or proportional weighting outcome of your data. So it's, it's uh, very important to understand some of the basics. Anybody who has tried to uh, create any kind of population allocation models um, knows how different it can be and uh, how how you have to be careful about the population estimates that you're creating for very fine resolution units. Question 22, and we have about eight minutes left, so if there's questions that we don't get to this, we'll do our best offline to fill them in, because um, there's been quite a few, must be a very intriguing topic to others. Uh, if comparing and sharing data are purposes of grids, we should keep the size of the cells fixed. If so, what is the best grid site for population and dwelling applications at a global level? Yeah, so I, I, I put in a whole paragraph here, but briefly, um, global data, and this is what we do in the PopGrid web viewer for direct comparison, is we've aggregated everything to essentially the lowest common denominator, which is 30 arc seconds, or roughly one kilometer. And then in the rest of the description, I note that you know the higher resolution products typically have more spatial detail in their inputs so they've been produced at higher spatial resolutions but for global um comparison 30 arc seconds is is if not a standard the practice that's currently used in the community good to know uh so what product question 23 what product is best in estimating population in rural areas in developing countries especially in areas covered by forests where hops are not often seen with mes medium resolution imagery, nor emit significant, significant lights at night. Yeah, so the um, the dense forest cover is a problem that is not completely solved. So, you know, um, none of the pro products are excellent at areas that are heavily forested, but the high resolution settlement layer, the HRSL, uses the highest resolution optical imagery of any of the products as an input based on 50 centimeter through to two meter in some areas uh, input. So it does the best job of finding small settlements in rural areas um, and has the most detail uh, for very small settlements out of all the products. Great, and question 24, for anybody who is not all that familiar with coding, Python, um, it looked like you used you know, some code in, in your demo um, 
do they need to know Python all that thoroughly in order to follow along with the, the, the GitHub demo that you showed today? They need to know Python a little bit. And, um, you know, if you know how to oper how to run Python, you could take that code that's available publicly and just swap in your own GeoJSON file and run it as is, and it should work fine. Um, um, yeah, I don't see any problems with that. The the I also noted in my answer that I, I typed out here that, you know, you can accomplish the same thing with QGIS or ArcGIS simply through the GUI. You don't have to know code to the, do the type of analysis I showed. So you could download the pop grid data sets. Uh, they're all linked to from the website and run zonal statistics across a subset of them and get your answers just completely through the interface. Yeah, I think it's really important for anybody who has not not made much um, progress on on uh, programming or any programming libraries. The data themselves are very simple. It's a simple data structure, so they are really easy to use just in a GIS environment and QGIS and ArcGIS, or ArcGIS whatever um, somebody is using, and uh, do some mapping, do some simple analysis, um, any kind of basic procedures in in a GIS environment. So um, anybody who has not seen these data should be encouraged to download them and play around with them and look at them. They are all free, freely accessible. Great. Uh, question 25, we seem to have lost the question, but we have the answer. So maybe we can infer <laughs> what the question was. Um, so I, I guess what you are uh, alluding to here, I'll let you take it. Yeah, sorry, I, I, don't, I don't think I deleted the question, but maybe I did by mistake. Um, so it, from what I recall, the question was, you know, um, I, I made the reference to the paper by Thompson et al. that, that talks about how slum areas are under, underestimated in global products. And, and the take home message would be that it, it would be best to use survey data uh, where available to, to get at either total population or household size to estimate population distribution in slums. Um, unfortunately, there's no good global source of uh, survey data from slums, so, but you could train a model to predict it in areas. Uh, but again, that would require, you know, knowing where the slums are. So this is something best done, you know, regionally or subnationally, you know, uh, at a city level or, or a country level, uh, where you've got ancillary data on the location of the slums so that you can do a better job of predicting the population. Okay, and question 26. What ancillary data can be taken as a proxy for sparsely dense grid and vice versa? Since road networks, lighting, built-up areas may be ambiguous to re represent actual density. Uh, the example here is slums with a lesser road density will have a greater population than the organized office area with more lighting and greater road density and built-up of a long question here, but um... yeah, it, it relates back to the previous question, and I'm, I'm sure Stefan or somebody else could provide detail. But I would I would definitely talk about um, survey data um, that give you uh, an estimate of the density, or like average household size inside of these areas that are less um, less well populated. It's it's you know, when using the more sophisticated models, these data don't have to be available everywhere. They can be used to predict it, um, the higher densities in areas that uh, that represent it. But it, it is an ongoing issue, and it is an area of active research, so we don't have a complete answer. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's a great example where where the um, problems might actually exist in, in these kinds of models. Imagine there's a model that's really calibrated towards um, intensity, um, nightlight intensity, or road network density, et cetera, um, a, a big proportion of the population would be miscalculated, obviously. So um, in such a case, it would be very important to know about some regionally different constraints, how the model has to be calibrated, um, what kind of input variables would be available, you know, what kind of new global data sets can we use as additional um, ancillary data as constraints and so on. So it's a great question um, and, and a good understanding of, of exactly these kind of problems inherent in, in the final outputs and the final data products. Thanks for the question. Great, thank you very much. And this will be the last question that we'll take here during the live Q&A. And 
Um, how accurate is the low elevation coastal zone data for a small island developing state like the Bahamas? What data set would you recommend being used? Um, I'm not sure if you showed this in your presentation, but um, are there some elevation data that's used through CDAC and put together with these? Yeah, I mentioned the low elevation coastal zone study that was a global study done using SRTM um, to define the coastal zone. And SRTM is a good consistent global data set. Um, but in small island states, what would be ideal is if you can obtain local elevation models to define your coastal zone. So whether it's from, you know, the, the Bahamian government or, or um, it may be possible to get even LIDAR derived, which is uh, light uh, imaging detection and range LIDAR data, which gives you a much more detailed look at the coastal zone distribution. And then you could, um, from LIDAR data, even can even pick up structures and start to look at a, you know, an analysis that tells you how many buildings are inside the coastal zone. So locally um, uh, available data may always be better than this global um, SRTM coastal zone uh, data set that we've defined. But we've provided it in part to look at a global assessment and and international comparisons. So um, it's it's useful for that level, but for local um single state studies you probably want to see if you can obtain much more detailed data and then you could take the methodology we used for defining the coastal zone and refine it based on the more detailed data and get a, a much better picture of um, of um, population or or even structures at risk to sea level rise or more frequent storms Great, thank you very much. So that was the last question for the session here today. So any of the questions that we didn't get to, please feel free to email me at my email address here or the general RSET Gmail account that you see all of your communications from us. Uh, and I can direct those to the appropriate um, personnel to maybe address those, or we'll get to the questions when we post this online in, in a week. Um, and hopefully we've got to all of them there. Um, we thank you very much for joining us here today. Greg, Stefan, this was wonderful. I hope that you learned a lot from the question and answer session too. I did indeed. Oh. Thanks very much. Thanks, Stefan. Yeah, we had some great questions. Thank you so much for, for all this interest. We really appreciate it. Yeah, and so um, I just want to say that uh, so next week, uh, same link to, to join, same time. We'll be meeting for part two of the series, the final part. At the end of that one, um, we will have the homework available for you. It'll be a Google form, and that will be uh, due April 27th. So um, we'll post this recording with the Q&A uh, in the video by tomorrow for you to review. And please join us next week where we're going to talk about some specific applications of the population data grid. So um, thank you very much, Stefan and Greg. Thanks for having us. Thanks very much. Have a good day.